so in June of 2017, Arvid and I founded a software as a service in the education technology space called Feedback Panda. And about a year after that, when it was generating 25K a month, we quit our jobs and went all in. And about a year after that, when we were at 55K MRR, we sold it to SureSwift Capital. So today, Arvid and I want to share how we went from founding to exit in about two years and some of the optimizations that made it all possible. So the first thing that we optimized was our audience. Quite often when I'm describing Feedback Panda, I have to start by describing the space that we actually fit into. And this is because we got super specific about the audience that we wanted to serve. Uh, let me just show you. So here's where we ended up. We were going to focus on ESL teachers based in the USA, teaching online to Chinese children contracted by Chinese kid English companies. Okay, this was, this was niche, but niche should not be confused with small. We knew at the time of our founding that one company alone operating under this kid English model already had 10,000 teachers and they were growing like crazy. Today, there are somewhere over 70,000 teachers contracted to work for this company. And this, was, this is currently 70,000 teachers with the same problem. So being, having this niche focus allowed us to uncover the common problem that each of these teachers shared. And then it allowed us to focus our energy in pro producing the product that would solve all of their, this one problem. So we built one product to solve one common problem, which translated to one standard use case. And that is the thing that informed all of everything that followed, including our marketing. So because we had this laser focus on this niche, communication was streamlined. We knew exactly who to talk to. We found out where these online teachers shared tricks of the trade, and we joined their communities. And so we weren't looking to get into the community and disrupt online teaching. We got into the community to observe to see what needs were being expressed by the teachers. And then when they expressed the need for our solution, we were there to present it. So from there, we grew organically and we turned the early adopters into ambassadors of our Feedback Panda tribe. And this is just a handful of the posts from teachers raving about Feedback Panda on Facebook. And our Instagram page is also full of posts um, from teachers giving product demos and urging their colleagues to join our club, to join the club we created for them. And so we really did create a tribe around our product and I would love to give another talk actually on how we leverage this user-generated content to then amplify the tribe effect that we created around Feedback Panda, which was our real marketing machine. But today, I think it's really important for you to understand that this was all possible because we found our audience first. We knew exactly who we were building our product for. So once we had the product, we knew who to talk to. And then on the foundational level, we optimized our team. Arvid and I are quite diverse in our skill set, but we really optimized this diversity by getting specific about the different roles that we would take on in our company. So we mapped out our company structure in a chart much like this one, uh, including every specific role that we thought was necessary for our team. Um, and the greatest consequence of doing something like this 
with not our fancy new uh, sea level titles, which were exciting, but it was actually uncovering the unwanted jobs. The jobs that were necessary and quite important for the business, but that neither of us uh, really wanted to do. So for example, neither of us was really excited about bringing up our skills and learning how to do European taxes. So this is something that we contracted an expert to take care of for us so that we could put our energy into the places that were exciting, that we wanted to bring up our skills in, or that we were better suited for. So as our company grew, we were able to stay a team of two based on some of the optimizations that Arvid is going to tell you about. All right, thank you. Okay, well, let's talk about operations, uh, one of the most enjoyable topics for every bootstrap business. Operations often contains a lot of tedious work, a lot of repetitive tasks, and they can take a long time, or they can just, there can just be a lot of them, right? A lot of stuff that you need to do manually and don't have the time for that. So having an audience like ours, knowing them really well and being very specific allowed us to deal with these things by documenting and by automating. Documentation really helps to speed up these tasks and automation is super helpful to reduce the number of those kind of things. Whenever our customers would reach out to us, um, they would pretty much always have very similar questions because they all use the tool in the same way and we build it to be a single purpose tool so their experience was always the same. And being a single purpose tool made this also pretty clear that for everything they would be doing, there's an optimal way to solve it. And once we communicated that to people, we had a full customer service conversation that we could just turn into a knowledge base article. We use Intercom for our customer service software, so whenever a future customer would have the same kind of question, they would be automatically suggested that kind of article, they would solve it themselves because that's what people really want to do. They don't want somebody to help them. To help them. They want to solve it themselves if they can, so we wouldn't have to do it. And if you do this a couple dozen times for your most common questions, maybe you need to do it a hundred times for all these kind of questions your product may have, then it really reduces the number of tickets that come in or that make it through that kind of self-serving stage. We would also start screen recording the things that we would still need to do manually like data merging, these kind of things that you just wouldn't be able to do automatically. And these screen recordings were for our internal use and would speed up ourselves when we would need to do it again. A nice side effect of this when we sold the business was that actually this made it very easy to onboard a customer service agent because we had all these videos and all this documentation already in place. So we didn't need any extra effort. Um, talking about automation, we have a lot of client-facing, customer-facing automation at Feedback Panda. We are a German company and we have a German bank account, or had at least, and American customers, and they have American credit cards. And for some reason, American banks really don't like sending money overseas, so they would block the charges quite often. So we built a custom dunning system to be able to talk to these people immediately after their, their card was declined and just get them to do the steps to call their bank so we could actually capture the value of their subscription and get them back into it. That was extremely helpful too. Answerbot is a feature that we use. That is an intercom feature where you have, can respond to certain kind of questions with pre-written answers. And we use that for, let's call it critical interactions, people that couldn't log in or people that needed to update their credit card before they could continue using the product and send them really specific messaging and also link them deeply into our product, which allowed us to, uh, them, allowed them to solve their own problem even while we were sleeping. So that was actually quite helpful for us, at least, to be able to sleep. Um, we would always keep the tone of all our customer service conversations um, quite personal, quite uh, informal, because we wanted people to be able to react to any message that we wrote and feel that it was a conversation. That was important for us. And it was actually quite nice that people really liked that. The stuff you just saw about Feedback Panda on Facebook, they also wrote that stuff about our customer support. And that is good marketing. If people like your support, their friends will actually notice. So that worked for us. I'm gonna talk about our onboarding strategy because that was super simple. We're a single purpose product with a single core value. So all we needed to do was to show these people this value as soon as we could. So they could understand, oh, can I create feedback fast? This is how you do it. Oh, that's the value of the product. So that was our whole onboarding strategy. We could focus extremely on that particular thing. And I really helped with conversion. Our conversion rates have been north of 30% for the whole 
duration of the business because people really understood what it was. All this documentation, all this automation really helped us in the due diligence phase of the actual acquisition because we would have a lot of information visibility just from using tools like this and using automation. There's a lot of data that gets gathered and an acquirer really wants to be able to focus on these kind of things. So they need to understand how many resources do we need to put in this kind of project? How many people do we need to hire? All this kind of stuff. And making this information visible through automation and documentation made that phase really easy. I'm gonna talk quickly about one last optimization that we made, one that doesn't really work for many or all SaaS businesses because it's a hit or miss pretty much. We built our own custom in-house referral system. We built that because we knew it was gonna work and we knew that it was gonna work because we knew our audience. They were not just teachers. These teachers were also recruiters. They were recruiters for the teaching companies, these schools, these Chinese teaching companies, because they had their own internal referral system where these schools would want their employees to recruit their friends and family to become teachers too. So the people already understood the value of a referral system, so we could just easily do it, it was a really safe bet, and it worked pretty well. In January 2019, when we increased our, increased our prices, um, by 50%, we also implemented that system, and 40% of all our new signups have been coming through this referral system, so that worked super well. So, in conclusion, um, being in a niche and knowing your audience really well was the most important part. Like the, everything else came from that. It allowed us to focus on the product that solved a proven problem. It allowed us to ignore all these extra variables, all these kind of um, edge cases and customizations that you would need to make in a larger market, and it allowed us to focus on our business. And it also really helped uh, us because we would be able to actually grow and sell the company within two years without hiring a single employee. It's great in the acquisition too, because during due diligence it wouldn't distract us with all the automation, and later it would be really uh, useful in the handover process as well because we had all the documentation in place. So thank you very much for listening to us. Hit the 12 minutes here. Thanks. Thank you.